By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim? Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And today I am playing against an old buddy of mine, Thijs. Hi Thijs. And uh, he's playing with a black aggro deck. And I'm bringing my Underworld Dreams deck to the table. Now this Underworld Dreams deck is not your typical combo deck. So it's not the kind of Underworld Dreams deck that everybody's used to. For example, I'm only playing it with black. So it's mono black. There are a lot of artifacts in there. So I guess we could call it black brown. Um, before I go into the deck tech, um, I just want to let you know that there's a timestamp in the description below. You can click the timestamp and it'll take you straight to game number one. For now, let's take a look at the decks. The first deck that I would like to take a look at is the deck of Thijs. And we can see here, this are some of his key cards. I don't have a deck picture, but he's playing black aggro. And of course that works uh, really well because black has a lot of smaller, powerful creatures like Stonefrong Devils, uh, the Black Knight, Hypnotic Spectre, of course, being one of the most important ones in this build. And you have access to Dark Ritual. So with Dark Ritual, you can quickly ramp into your creatures. He's also playing with Juggernaut. It's personally one of my favorite creatures to see. I know, I understand it's not being played that often, but I still think it's five power for four. I mean, everybody used to play it back in the day. Um, so I'm, I'm really happy to kind of see these cards getting some more play in, in decks like this. So that's the black aggro build. There's not much more to say uh, about this brew. I am curious um, um, to see what uh, ties his ideas of, you know, drawing cards. Because with these aggro decks, what can happen is that you just play out your entire hand, you put in a lot of pressure on the board, but then when your opponent manages to stabilize, especially me in this case, because I've kind of have this control built, if I can stabilize against him, then I'm pretty sure I'm I'm winning unless Thijs has a way to quickly draw more cards and keep the pressure on. So I'm really curious to see how he's going to do that with this black aggro build. Okay, let's take a look at my deck. Okay, so this is my deck. As you can see, it's creatureless. So it's, I really want to kill my opponent with the play set of Underworld Dreams and the three warp artifacts that you see there. And um, obviously I'm playing with Howling Minds because if I let my opponent draw more, that means he gets more damage. Now I only want to let him draw cards if I kind of have the game under control. So when I have my Winter Orbs out and I've got that uh, Relic Barrier going, that combination, that Parfait combo, uh, some Icy Manipulators to tap down the lands that he does untap. So then I kind of have that lock. Now just in case, because there, there are other things that can be really annoying. I've decided to put in four sinkholes as well, just to also be able to keep him very low on land. So I'm curious to kind of see if this is going to work out or if sinkhole and winter orb is going to contradict each other. Because when you look at it at first glance, you think, why would you have land removal if you also play with the winter orb? Well, I have a few reasons for that. First of all, sinkhole is just a guaranteed removal of a, of, a, of a land. It destroys a land. We also know that in this old school meta, there are so many powerful lands. Sometimes you just need to get rid of a land. And of course, I'm talking about Loa here. And also, winter orb is an artifact. So it's, you know, very sensitive to removal. So I'm also expecting my opponent to be able to remove this. Now, another thing that I want to mention here is that my relic barrier, the reason I'm playing with a full play set, because you might think that's a bit much also looking at the icy manipulators in this deck is that i can use the uh, relic barriers also to tap down the mishra's factories because that can lead to a lot of threats as well and i can also use it of course just to tap down mana rocks moxes and all that stuff so the relic barrier is actually in combination with sinkhole that alone can already kind of get my opponent into mana trouble now i also have something called a transformational sideboard when after the first game maybe my opponent is going to see hey he's not playing with any creatures i'm going to board them out and then i can board in my creatures so i'm really curious to kind of see how all my synergies work and maybe maybe i shouldn't play sinkhole and winter orb together in a deck i don't know just have to see how it's going to work out. I'm curious to hear um, your opinion about this. What do you think? Would you play or uh, Winter Orb or Sinkle? Or would you consider playing both? And if so, why would you do that? Okay, so this is my deck. Let's go to game number one. Game number one. And it's Dice, the opponent on the left or with the black sleeves. I'm playing with the, I guess you could call them silver sleeves, metallic sleeves. And I'm playing on the right side, of course, with the Timmy playmat. Now, the quality of the pictures of this particular match is not great, but it was still a very enjoyable duel. 
So I decided to put it on there and look at it. It seems like Thijs is taking a mulligan, so the London mulligan rule. He gets to start though with a basic swamp and pass, turn, pass his turn here. Swamp. Ooh, look at that great start for me here. This is what you want to do. This is actually one of the main reasons I play Dark Ritual, just to give me that option of having that Underworld Dreams turn one. So this is not looking great for Thijs already. Oh, and there's a Howling Mine. Of course, Thijs is playing Black Aggro, so maybe this Howling Mine is actually going to help him, and he's going to just start throwing up. Um, <laughs> throwing up. <laughs> Sorry, Thijs. I'm sure you're not going to start throwing up, but I mean he's going to start playing a lot of um, creatures. Oh, look at this. Oh, no. A Mind Twist. Oh, oh, no. This is not good. I felt so confident with that Howling Mine up. At least I still get to draw two cards a turn. And, I mean, I am eating away at uh, Thais' life total. I do think he's forgetting to take damage, or did he? Well, time will tell. Anyway, luckily I have that Maze of If to stop that Hypnotic Spectre. He also played a Stone Throwing Devil. And what I really like about Thais, like he has his own little preferences, like he's playing with uh, Desert. He always tells me that Desert is a very good card. I do play it in my Timmy deck. Oh, look at that, a Paralyze over the flyer and now he's going to 13 because of the underworld dreams interesting now to see what he can do next there's a juggernaut and I mean he can attack but I have that maze of if in place drawing two cards here let's see what I can find tapping for two interesting demonic tutor what will I tutor for Maybe a Relic Barrier? Maybe another Underworld Dreams? Perhaps that's the best, but I don't know if I have any Swamps in my hand. Playing another Mace of If, so I have no idea. I guess that was already in my hand. It's not a bad card to play out at this time. I really, really like these Mace of Ifs in these control decks. I also understand that some people that enjoy playing very aggro are not very happy with the fact that it's no longer restricted. It's enough, for me, it's another reason in Swedish to play with a lot of land removal or for me to play with like Blood Moon when you have the chance because of, because of Maze of Ifs and already because of the Loa and the, and the factories. Because I do think that there are a lot of answers. There's an old school land removal in almost every color. Look at that there. We see we're talking about it and we're seeing an example of it. We see a nice sinkhole on one of the Maze of Ifs and I only take one damage. It's first blood for me. The first damage I get, I mean, um, I'm on 19 still. So things are looking good for me as a control player playing against an aggro brew. There's a sinkhole from my side here. Just taking care of one swamp so that he can no longer play out those juggernauts. And there's another sinkhole. Look, uh-oh. Trouble, trouble, trouble. Having to take six damage here. Going to 13. And I have to find a way now to deal with the Juggernauts. My Mace of Ifs are just gone. That's that's a way to deal with it. Another Paralyzed Honest Juggernaut. And oh, look at this, a Warp Artifact. Oh no, that means it's going to take extra damage here. He's now on six. It's a bit hard to see. Ooh, and this could be the end. There is that mana number four and a Soul Ring. That's very important for Thais, of course because he wants to untap his creatures to put some pressure on the board. Paying even more mana here, four mana for another Juggernaut, dealing one damage. Oh, he can deal a lot of damage next turn. Can I survive? Playing a Winter Orb, I think this is decisive here. Although he can still untap, yeah, and he can untap one of his creatures. Paying for untapping the Juggernaut, drawing two cards. Oh, look at that, he actually was on... F oh, of course, he's getting three damage. He's on three. I'm going to one life. I think I'm going to win this one. Let's see. Playing a... Oh, just to be... Just in case I'm playing on my own Mind Twist. Playing it for four. And that's it. That's game. <laughs> oh, that was so close. It was on one. 
One measly life. Oh, this is really nice to uh, to look back at. Oh, man. Okay, um, we're now going to our sideboards, and we'll see you back in game number two. Game number two is about to start. And after winning that first home, but that was a very, very, very close victory. And you can see that I'm getting into trouble as soon as those mates of ifs are, uh, are dealt with. And I didn't find any relic barriers, by the way, because those are great tools against... Uh, Thijs, uh, his juggernauts. It looks like I've taken a mulligan here. Looking at my hand again, not sure. Oh, I have to put two cards on the bottom. Oh, man, so I'm starting with just with five. That's not great. There's Stone Throwing Devils, turn one. Again, a Dark Ritual, this time into a Howling Mine. Remember, there's no mana burn in Swedish old school. There is another Swamp. He can attack me now. That's exactly what he's going to do. I'm on, on 19 here. There's a Sinkhole. Ay ay ay. I do think it was a good decision to play that Howling Mine because I need to get some cards back. Playing a basic Swamp. I think it was... I think that Sinkhole is going to gonna be a problem. And look at that. Hypnotic Spectre. I need an answer for that hippie. So a Maze of If. There's a Maze of If. Great. Or a Paralyze would have helped as well. But the Maze of If, at least it's an answer for now. There's a Blight. Probably coming in from the sideboard here. Very, very nice addition, uh, Thijs. Because that takes care of a Maze of If. I also am getting another damage from the Devils. Tapping for the Relic. At least I've got something going here. But now he's going to hit me for three and I have to discard a card. And this is one of those games where already very early on you kind of feel like, okay, I'm not going to, not going to be able to take this one. Then again, if I'm able to, it's only a bonus. And I wonder if I took two or just one. I feel like I only took one card, but... Hey, that's my own mistake. Playing a Relic Barrier here. Tapping the Howling Mine again. Passing turn. So I'm probably... I can tap down the Juggernaut now. That's going to buy me some time. Tapping the Juggernaut. There's another Hypnotic Spectre hitting the board. Attacking for 3 here. Going to 11. Losing the Relic Barrier. Drawing two cards. I mean, I'm on 11 already. There's so many cards on the battlefield right now. A Pestilence would really be helpful, but I can't play it yet because I only have three cards. There's a Paralyze. At least that can slow him down a little bit. And look at that combination. I've got both Parfait going on here. And I'm actually keeping one of my relics now for the Juggernaut. And I'm, or I'm not, I'm not, I'm tapping it down. What is he going to do? And I really enjoy this, seeing this Paralyzed combo going um, with the Winter Orb. And let's see. Tapping the Juggernaut, and there's an attack for three here. Losing a Swamp. There's a Relic Barrier. Ooh, and that's going to get me in trouble, I feel. Because now he can tap my Winter Orb. That's probably what he's doing right now. Oh, he's, he's tapping my Howling Mine. He doesn't want me to draw any extra cards. Interesting decision here. Of course, it depends on what's in his hand. Look at him untapping all that stuff. I can tap down his Juggernaut. Attacking here for three. Again, losing life, losing. Look at that. Tapping his Relic Barrier at the end of turn. That does mean that I only get to untap one land because I couldn't untap uh, my Winter Orb. It's getting a little bit confusing now with uh, Relic Barriers on both sides of the table. Let's see what I can do. 
playing a mind twist for two. What else can I do? I am tapping the Howling Mind. I don't want to fuel his hand, or I'm not. Look at that. I'm kind of confused here myself. The problem is if I tap down the Howling Mind, then Dice can play it in a way so that I cannot tap his Juggernaut, or no, that's not true. Anyway, it's confusing. Let's, uh, let's make a long story short. It's confusing. So two cards here for Tice, deciding not to tap my Howling Mine. And now he's attacking. I'm tapping, of course, to Juggernaut. I have to throw away my Warp Artifact here. Going to three life. Another Stone Throwing Devils. Tapping his Relic Barrier so I can at least draw two cards. And, of course, that's why I decided not to... Um, not to use that Relic Barrier on the Howling Mind earlier, because I need two of those, one to tap the Juggernaut and one to tap his Relic Barrier end of turn. But I don't think it's going to save me. There are just too many creatures on the board here. And of course, that constant pounding by the Hippie makes, makes me to, to throw away a lot of my cards here. I'm able to at least survive for one more turn using that maze on the Hypnotic Spectre, tapping his Relic Barrier, so I get to draw two cards. Playing another Swamp, and that's it, that's game. <laughs> I'm showing in my hand. Oh man, okay, well, well done, well done. I, I think going down to five cards kind of was crucial, especially in combination with that early Sinkhole and his uh, Stone Throwing Devils. He had a really nice curve in this uh, second game. So uh, I'll go back to my sideboard. And it looks like Tice is doing the same. And we'll see each other again uh, for game number three. Game number three. It's 1-1 one, one here. At least I get to start. Hopefully I don't have to mulligan all the way to five. Because when you're playing against like aggress an aggressive aggro deck. And you know, you've got to go all the way back to five. I mean, it's never easy. But that was making it really difficult. And look at that. It looks like Tice is now taking a mulligan. He is on the draw. So if he goes down to six, he can just draw number seven. So hopefully for him, he doesn't have to. Um, you know, he can just keep at least six cards. It's also nicer, especially in, in, in a third decisive game. You kind of always hope, actually, that there will be no mulligans. He's just seven against seven. Oh, he's shuffling this away as well. I think in that case, now it's really Thais who's already in trouble here because, you know, having an aggro built means that you need a lot of fuel. And that's, for example, for instance, when um, a Wheel of Fortune is very useful. Of course, the, the blue power is, is incredibly useful when it comes to refueling your hand. Uh, you can use a Jadam Tome, although that's pretty slow and usually not really... Um, you know, part of the, the aggro builds because it's so slow. I do believe that Thais is using the little book, by the way, from the Antiquities, where you get to draw a card and then you discard a card. And that can kind of help to filter through the lands you don't need. Look at that quick sinkhole, hoping that maybe he's gone for a hand with not a lot of lands. There's another Stone Throwing Devil, so he is managing to put some pressure on the table here. Another Sinkhole, wow. <laughs> this is very unfortunate for Tice, because probably, oh, he's, at least he has a land, that's something, but these Sinkholes are really slowing him down. I wonder, maybe I boarded out the Winter Orbs, who knows, because it's not as effective against decks like this. Playing a Hypnotic Spectre. So that gives me at least a blocker. And of course, next turn, if it stays on the, on the battlefield, he has to discard another card. There's that desert. If only he would have had two, then he can kill the hippie. Playing a Relic Bearer that can be very useful against my deck, but not right now. Attacking, meaning he's losing another card. And he's losing his Hypnotic Spectre. Tapping, playing another Hypnotic Spectre here. At least finding a Soul Ring. A 
attacking here with one, losing the juggernaut. Ay, 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 and that's very unfortunate. There's my own relic barrier, so I get to tap down his soul ring, but of course he taps my relic in response to me casting it. And then I can tap his soul ring, but he can just untap it, so no worries. But now he needs to play out this card, but he can't. So that means he's going to lose yet another card. And I I kind of feel that game two and three, because we both had to go down to just five cards in hand, um, you know, weren't the best games in terms of watching like, okay, how, you know, w what's the best deck? If you can still follow uh, what I'm saying here. Drawing another card, he taps down my Howling Mind this time. I think I should have used my Relic Barrier there to tap down his Relic Barrier. Then again, I don't want him to draw into anything, so I guess I'm also fine with this formula. So I'm tapping down his Soul Ring, because I don't want to give him any more mana. Because I'm, I'm winning here, he's on 10, I can deal 4 damage at a time. I don't want him to be able to make anything out of this game still. That's basically it. Attacking now. And playing playing a Royal Assassin. Passing turn. So here you can see that I've probably put in the creatures from my sideboard into the main board. Because that Royal Assassin is a sideboard card. So remember I have the transformational sideboard where I have almost only creatures in my sideboard. I mean, he is on six. What can he really do here? At least he has some mana to spend, but he has no cards in hand. So then it's the mana are not very useful. And it looks like he's tap. He's tapping my relic barrier. Interesting. That's I think is a good decision because now I can he can draw two cards next turn as well. Oh, and look at this. It's already over with that bad moon. Oh, look at that. I wanted to. <laughs> Pointing out to him that I really wanted to play out this card. But anyway, like I said, I kind of feel like game two and game three were, I wouldn't say ruined, they were interesting, but they were very much decided by the fact that we both had to go down to five cards in hand because of a double mulligan. Anyway, thank you for watching this episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And let's take a look at the Patreons of Timmy Talks who are supporting the show. Thank you so much for that. Let's take a look at the end scroll. Ich kann das Finger zu Sumba gesehen.